In physiology, one of the key concepts is the concept of homeostasis. And in homeostasis, basically what you're looking at is that the body is going to be maintaining some type of internal set point. At some point, you're going to have a stimulus that comes in and disrupts that set point. In the process of homeostasis, we're going to have a series of responses, kind of cause and effects, which is going to bring the body back into homeostasis, so back into that normal set point. A key way of studying these cause and effect uh, steps in homeostasis is the use of flow charts. To demonstrate how we can use flow charts in the study of physiology, we're going to take a look at blood glucose levels. Now normally in the body, blood glucose levels are going to be at a set point uh, that's going to be efficient at delivering glucose to the cells that need it. Uh, but what happens is if it starts to go too high, we're going to have a situation where we're going to be in hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia, hyper for higher than glycemia, uh, glyco for sugar, emia for blood, basically looking at too high a level of glucose in the blood. Uh, or this could drop, and if we drop down below that set point, we're going to be in a situation of hypoglycemia. Hypo for lower, glyco for sugar, emia for blood. So we're looking at a situation where the body is uh, basically has too little amount of glucose within the blood. And so in the process of homeostasis, if we have hyperglycemia, we're going to have factors that are going to try to drive the blood glucose levels down. If we have hypoglycemia, we're going to be looking at a situation where we're going to have a series of steps that are going to try to drive the blood glucose levels back up. Uh, and so we're going to look at insulin as an example of a flow chart, as an example of a homeostatic process that occurs when we're in this hyperglycemia situation. To use a flow chart in the study of physiology, it's important to mark down all of the steps. And in some cases, it means putting in steps that you may think are kind of insignificant or unimportant, but there are no unimportant things in the process of physiology. So we're going to start out with a situation where you're basically going to be ingesting a meal. Uh, so you have a nice hearty meal in the process of eating your food. The food is going to get into uh, the stomach where it's going to be digested. And then it's going to move into the small intestine where it's going to be absorbed. Once the glucose is absorbed by the small intestines, we're going to see the situation where glucose is going to enter the blood. So at this point, what we're going to have is going to be the stimulus. And this is going to be important when you're studying these homeostatic processes that you're able to identify what the stimulus is. In this case, we're going to see that the glucose levels rise in the blood. And we're going to have the situation of being, again, hyperglycemia. Now, when you're doing these flow tarts, you can put it in as words, so glucose levels rise, or you can use arrows to show an effect. And so in this case, we're seeing an increase in glucose levels in the blood. At that point, the glucose is going to be circulating through the body and it's going to interact with some type of sensor. In this case, the sensor are going to be the beta cells in the pancreas. And these beta cells in the pancreas are, in essence, going to recognize an increase in the blood glucose levels by an increase in glucose metabolism within these cells. 
as a response and still within the beta cells in this uh, in this situation we're going to have a control center and the control center and the sensor are not necessarily going to be the same uh, in all areas of um, homeostasis or all areas of the flow chart so the beta cells are going to begin to secrete insulin that has already been stored um, within the cell uh, and it's also going to begin to increase the production of insulin and so in this case again uh, secreting insulin releasing the insulin uh, and you can write this as an increase in insulin that is going to be distributed throughout the body so we've got uh, a stimulus up here in red, which is the increase in glucose within the blood. Uh, that is going to be uh, evaluated by the sensor function within the beta cells. The control center uh, is basically going to uh, trigger an effector response, or basically a response where we're going to be secreting the insulin. So we're indicating that we're increasing the insulin levels here. And then that insulin then is going to be distributed through the body. It's going to be a hormone. It's going to get into the bloodstream. It's going to circulate through the body. And then we're going to start to see a response. So with this response, basically what's going to happen is that the insulin will bind to receptors. Okay, so it's going to bind to receptors on insulin sensitive cells such as muscle, uh, liver, and fat cells uh, and this uh, insulin receptor is basically going to cause these cells to do something in response in essence to that increase in blood glucose level what it's going to do is it's going to cause an increase in glucose transporter molecules So these are going to be molecules, uh, transport proteins that are going to be located now within the membrane that's going to move the glucose into the cells. And then once it's in the cells, it's going to do some things. It's going to increase metabolism. So if we think about what metabolism is, we're basically using the glucose to uh, feed into the process of cellular respiration and produce ATP and that ATP can be used by the cells to uh, basically power whatever that needs to be done uh, so it's going to be uh, increase the metabolism you know we want to indicate I'm running out of space so I'll do this over here increase uh, glycolysis and then it's going to result in an increase in ATP that ATP didn't show up too well uh, so it's going to be an increase in ATP. It's also going to stimulate the storage of glucose. And so in cells like uh, liver cells and muscle cells, we're going to bring the glucose in. The storage is basically going to result in an increase in glycogen. Now, glycogen is going to be a, a polymer where we basically take those glucose monomers and store them up for a later period of time. In addition to that, within fat cells, what's going to happen is they're going to take some of the products of glycolysis up here and they're going to result in the increase in the production of fatty acids. And these fatty acids then can contribute to an increase in triglycerides. And I'm running out of space over here, so we're going to indicate over here that the overall effect is to decrease blood glucose levels. Okay, so if we take a look at this, the stimulus is that we've got an increase in blood glucose uh, causing a situation of hyperglycemia, increase in blood uh, glucose within the blood. The beta cells are going to act as a sensor. They're also going to act as a control center. So they're going to recognize this increase in blood glucose levels. Then we're going to respond by 
releasing. So we had an increase in insulin within the body. That insulin as a hormone is going to circulate through the body, bind the cells with receptors that are responsive to it. So they're insensitive, sensitive cells. Uh, we're going to bring more glucose into the cells with increase in transport molecules. We're going to increase the metabolism. We're going to increase the storage. Overall, what's going to happen is we're going to cause a decrease in the blood glucose levels. And so basically what's going to happen then is that we're going to have a negative feedback process. It's going to come back here and as a negative feedback process, it's going to counteract or basically reverse that stimulus. And so we had an increase in blood glucose up here. Down here, we pulled the glucose out of the blood. And so we're basically bringing these higher than normal levels of blood glucose back down to that homeostatic level. Uh, and so I ran out of space here a little bit, but hopefully you get an idea about how we can use flow charts to show the cause and effect series of steps that go from uh, basically the physiological process before the stimulus, identify the stimulus, identify the sensor or control center, and take a look at the response and see basically are we increasing or decreasing things along the way as we study these cause and effect processes.